Why do you eat people? Not people. Brains. Brains only. Yes. Okay, anyways, continuing. She she did not have uh she she had a lot of nip, nippage. Yeah, well, we we I sculpted her so that she matched Bill's designs and she was very busty. When I brought it in, I I put it down and showed it to Bill Stout. He loved it. Then Graham Henderson, the British guy came oh. in, looked at it. Oh God. Looked Were at you? me and said, come into my office. <gasps> so I go in his office um, and in a nutshell, he basically said, um, really nice work. What would you like your screen credit to read? And I freaked out. I was again in my early twenties and this was my first chance oh my for God. a screen credit. Yeah. And all of this came from Brian Peck wanting some, some teeth for teeth. a script read through. So it was just this great, cool journey. And then once that happened, then I was able to also go on set with it and puppeteer it. But walk us through this iconic scene though, because this is crazy. She comes through the window and she chomps. So there's the very first scene, There's it was all on a soundstage and there's a rain box um, outside of a window on a stage. Oh. And there's a bunch of us standing in the rain. Most everybody else was a ghoul, and I was a guy in a raincoat holding uh, a ghoul puppet yeah. posable with, with a posable hand. And my goal is to grab Brian Peck's arm, and then it's all up to Brian to act like he's actually being pulled, and I'm just adding stuff to him. <laughs> and then when she comes through the window, and Brian's blood sprays, the type of blood that they used, <gasps> stained. Yeah, that makes sense. Which is why her hair is all red. Oh, yeah, because we, my dad and I go back and forth on this because I c keep thinking she's a redhead and it's just from the blood that was off of Brian's head and she's yeah. actually blonde. And yeah. you're, you're right, she is blonde. Okay, so if you look... Oh, yeah, her nightgown went... Yeah, her nightgown seconds. is visible for like a split second. Then you see it. Right there on the hips. Yes. And then he chops the, it off and it stays behind. And that's how we get our half corpses. Yeah, that's how she ends half. up naked, basically. And Brian's makeup and rig was done by Kenny Myers, a super talented makeup effects artist. Where are you in on this floor? I'm, there's a monofilament going up to a loop hanging from the ceiling, and I'm just off to the side oh, pulling you're it on like a, stage. a fish. Oh, my God. And we just can't see it because it's so thin. It's framed um, out. If you look closely... If you, you can see it, and you can see the way her head's bobbing. You can see where the attachment. Dad, plays. you're ruining the magic of but cinema. Just so you know, you can do things <laughs> super cheap. No, and for those of you at home who are like, "What the fuck is monofilament?" It's fishing line. It's fishing line. It's fishing, line. It's, fishing yeah. line. it's just that's the fancy SFX word for it. And if it shines on screen, take a black sharpie and you wipe the sharpie on it to paint it black, and it's matte and it goes away. But most of the time they can light it so that it doesn't, it's not visible. I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. know that hack with a Sharpie. But that's something. how we got her to move in the wide shots. And then for the close-up shots where the brains fall out of her mouth, my hand went into the back of her head. And then... Um, She's a hand puppet, yeah. correct? Okay. And, and my fingers moved the eyes. I, it was basically a thimble with a rig built off the thimble that went to the, to the two eyes. And my finger went in the thimble. And there was a handle I could hold. So that I could turn the head and make it move, and then I could move the eyes with my finger, and then the jaw was a separate mechanism. And I, I didn't feel comfortable trying to do all that, knowing the lines and the dialogue and do the performance. So I figured, okay, Brian's dead. He's not in this scene. <gasps> Is Brian helping you puppeteer? Brian's doing the mouth and doing the lines of dialogue on, on set. So if you watch the <sighs> scenes... Uh, prior to them putting in the woman's voice, it's Brian. Oh my it. God, I so wish they had the raw audio file. They might, somewhere. <gasps> and then um, I got Bill Stout, the production designer, to do the spine movement. So he's doing the cable that does that. And then there was a syringe that squirts methicil out the end of the For spine to be like, in my eyes, spinal fluid. Do you have basically. fluid in your spine? Yes. Oh. Yeah. These shots when it's top down and we don't see the bottom of the table, is there a hole in the table for your hand to go through? There's, uh, conveniently, on an embalming table, there's a drain hole. Oh! Under the head. So my God. Pop the drain cover off. So my hand went up that. 
And then the, the cables from the arms, um, actually, I think one went through a hole in the table. We drilled a hole in the table at the elbow for one, and then the other one looped around. You hit it with the rope. And then the um, spine had a push-pull thing, and all, all that stuff went through the, the hole that my hand went through. Was that an actual more morgue uh, table? Yeah, it so, was an actual embalming table. Wow, you were puppeting through it's pretty neat. a lot of brain juice went through that hole. Yeah, well. Did you think about that? Uh, no. Oh, okay. I don't know if it had been used. Oh. But it was an actual embalming table. That's cool. I didn't ask. And if you watch the film, I'm in it in a gray t-shirt on the floor under the table quite often. Oh on my screen. god. I have um, this pulled you up. You have to you have to know where to look. Dad, no, because I was watching this the other day and I was yeah, like, you don't notice it because I mean the No, but I was looking it. for you. I was looking for you because I was like, where the fuck it's not, is dad? It's not like super obvious, but it's like if you stop it, it's like there's somebody there. In the very beginning when she's revealed and she talks for the first time, you can see under the table and there's nothing there because I'm scooted way behind her. Oh. I have my hand forward. Okay. And all the cables go back behind me. So it establishes that there's nothing under the table. And then, and then as the scene goes on, it gets a little lax. And at one point, I think we used like a lunch tray, attached a lunch tray to help hide me on the side of the table. Another time they took the drape that's on the bottom. Oh, the continuity it up is a little bit. Really um, all over the place. Because there's no, yeah. there's no VFX. It was pre all of that. Wow, that's crazy. So it's you, Brian, and the production designer uh -huh, helping out. out. Yeah. Uh huh. Wow. Yeah. Three, then, three people to operate. And then her. I think Scott Ressler did the fingers on one hand, and I forgot who did the fingers on the other hand. And we only shot her for I, I want to say like a day or two. We got to know some of the cast because not all the cast was in that scene. Yeah. And then when I got to go back and do the half dog, I got to meet uh, Jim and Karen and a bunch of other people. Being able to just sort of like hang out and watch what was going on, got to know a lot of people. And over time since, got to know uh, the rest of the cast. And they're all still just as genuine and wonderful now as, as they were, they were then. then. Those, yeah. of those who are still with us. Did you know, I just discovered this today, this man. James Karen. Yeah, he was uh, he was like the spokesperson for uh, a, a food mart. Yes. At the time, that's what yeah. he was known for. Yeah, he did. It's time to really start thinking about outdoor entertaining. And Pathmark's ready with big coupon values like these. Buy any package of fresh chicken parts from Pathmark's fresh quality meat department, and you'll get a bottle of Kraft barbecue sauce free. He'd been in Puzzlegeist as the the land developer that oh that fucks them moved over. the headstones but didn't move the bodies. You son of a bitch, you moved the cemetery but you left the bodies, didn't you? You son of a bitch, you left the bodies and you only moved the headstones. You only moved the headstones. <laughs> he played a couple other bad guys. And then after Return of the Living Dead, uh, Dan O'Bannon did a remake of a 50s movie called Invaders from Mars. And Dan called me and asked if it would be okay if he could name the family, the lead family, their, have their last name be Gardner in the movie. And I'm like, yeah, that would be awesome. Jimmy Karen ended up being in it as the Marine uh -huh. that fights the Martians. But he has just such a great sense of humor, and he, he's, he's just such a fun guy. He took lines and, and just, like, Marines have no qualms about killing Martians and stuff like that, and just made stuff really kind of fun. Did they keep our last name? Yeah, the, the main <sighs> characters are the gardeners. Oh, and then my God, we're famous. Toby Hooper directed it, and Stan Winston did the effects for it. I was going to do some smaller stuff for it as an independent contractor, and that's in... Uh, work out. But I did help Stan. I did go to Stan's and help them finish Invaders from Mars and actually go on set. Oh, cool. I got to see uh, Jimmy again. And I, I got to see him since. And all the Return of the Living Dead guys, they all make an effort to like get together and go have Aww. tacos or whatever. And still do, which is pretty great. I love you know? that. Yeah. And but, but Brian directed... This is a total side note. Brian. Brian Peck directed uh, a series of short films. It was called The Willies. Okay. And he had James Karen in it for one of the episodes. And James played a janitor in an elementary school <laughs> who was secretly a monster that was basically eating kids. Okay. And he lived in the ceiling above the, the bathroom. 
Oh. And he wore a human costume and he could peel it off. And Brian Peck got Bill Stout, the production designer from Turn Living Dead, to design the creature. Oh. And I built it. I was at Doug Beswick's at the time. And then Brian and I puppeteered it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I also had to do some makeup effects on on Jimmy. So I had to do a head cast of, of Jimmy. Do you still have it? And I don't think so. Oh. No. But he has an evil sense of humor, a Uh-oh. super evil sense of humor. I did the live cast at, at Rick Shop, actually, and it was on a Saturday, and James came out, and the body of his character is supposed to be slumped over. So I had Jimmy in a chair with his feet up on another chair, like a director's chair, and his arms up on the side. So so that all this was kind of like slumped down because he was older. And then Brian Peck helped me do the live cast. So if you're Brian, okay, Jimmy's head's here, and the whole body goes this way, and he's sitting this way. So okay. I'm working on him, and Brian's helping me. Yes. And I'm putting the bowl of water to finish the bandages on his waist, and and Jimmy's holding it so that we can Do work. It, He's it. just being super helpful. We get everything done, and I lean in and I tell Jimmy, "All right, all the bandages are on. We're gonna wait a couple minutes for it to start to Party. set, and you'll feel it get warm. And at that point, we'll loosen it up and we'll take all this stuff off. And it covered him all the way down to the end of his bitties." Like the the sternum, you okay. know, like like all the way down here. He didn't respond when I said that, and I went to. And I'm like, I'm going to take the bowl out of your out of your hands now. And I take the bowl, and his arm just goes, and and just hangs and swings next to him. And I remember looking up at Brian, just pure panic in my eyes, and oh then God. pure panic in Brian's eyes. And all it, all that's going through my head is, oh my God, I, I just killed James Karen. And there was no way to check for heart. Oh, because, because it was next... covered, everything was covered, including his chest. So I couldn't check for a heartbeat. What about his wrist? Didn't even think of it. <laughs> check for for air. Because they have nose holes. They have nose holes. In yeah, them. there's no there's no breathing coming out of the nose holes. That I'm like, oh my god! I'm like, we got to get him on the floor and we got to get this off of him. And I grab the sides of it and I'm like, I'm just going to tear this off, Brian. I grab the sides of the thing to pull off of his face. All of a sudden, both of his hands shot up, grabbed my wrist, and all I hear is, ho, 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 ho. I was so mad, but I was, like, so oh relieved. Oh, my God. And as soon as it was off of his face enough where he could talk, he's like, but you didn't know I could hold my breath for a minute and a half. Oh, my God. He used to be, like, a superstar athlete and had great... Who is this man? Yeah, so he totally, like, prank, That's so... Us. Me, oh my the most god! And I'm like, I'm like, dude, I am so gonna get you someday. I'm gonna take this body of you, and I'm gonna knock on your door. When your wife comes to the door, I'm gonna pitch this body off your roof. I'm gonna do something to get you back, and I, I never did, because oh it god. was all at her, at her expense and not his. I yeah, could never but, come up with anything. Yeah, that's true. That was gonna get him his own dead body. Go to his yeah. wife's house, cast his wife's entire body, then yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. But, so it was it was a very fun group of people all in all and and we all stayed in touch and worked on other yeah. things afterwards which was great. Besides Brian is there anyone from like the main cast that you really loved working with? I mean obviously everybody but like um the the teenagers also like I think what- all of them I I really enjoyed like everybody. Everybody had a unique personality, personality and they were just so welcoming and we were all kind of the same age. Yeah, just excited to be like making something yeah, as kids. Yeah, so we were all having fun and and they were paying us to to, to do stuff some that shit. We would have loved to have done. Yeah, they got some really great people in this cast. Stanzi Stokes was the casting agent and I I feel like it's so perfectly cast. It's funny, um, Spider. The all these names we have. The, we have Suicide, Trash, Scuzz, yeah. Spider. Yeah, Spider is is super skinny uh-huh. in this, and in the Dan's original script, he was a big stocky guy named Meat. Oh. And then when Miguel Nunez came in and, and read, they fell in love with Miguel's performance, and Miguel's 
very spindly, thin guy. So they're like, uh, his name doesn't fit. Let's call him Spider. I like that better because meat seems like too on the nose for a zombie movie, huh. you know, because they're eating meat. Oh. Also, just this girl's like naked in a cemetery half yeah. of the movie. I wanted to yeah. kind of dress up as trash. Her name's Trash in the movie, right? Yeah. Yeah, I kind of want to dress up as trash, but I was like, mm, let me like not be the character that's just like naked and wanting to die by zombies in a cemetery. Yeah, see, these frickers are sprinting. Yeah, they did oh, it before no, Zombieland. I, the day that I went to meet Graham Henderson on set to be approved to do my job was the day outdoors where they had the rain machine on. So I'm like, oh, this is great. This yeah. is like totally cliche, like horror movie night, rain machines, backlit rain, middle of nowhere, big open parking lot. They set me in a director's chair and just told me to wait for Graham. And I'm just like watching this. And then all of a sudden, these two people come running around the corner and then this mob comes after them. I'm like, oh my gosh. Holy shit, those are zombies. And and they were like spooking it. Yeah, big time. So you gotta be there. For that day, you watch that in real time. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I was I was very fortunate. Oh man, and the the when they're like send more paramedics. Yeah, that's fucked up. Send more paramedics. The thing people don't really think about is the fact that all these scenes had to be shot in the rain. So not only like you have a first time director, low budget horror movie. Oh my god, all those exteriors just about. Just about all of them are, are, rain. are with giant rain machines. And the shots are wide, so the machines are big and up high on cranes. And, oh, my God. And the, the rain has to be lit in order to show. Oh, I so, didn't even, like, of course. I've, I've yet to shoot rain in my lifetime, and it, I don't want to. It looked beautiful, but just, like, everybody's cold and wet. And, and, yeah. And it's just, like, so difficult. And Dan was so great to work with with me for all of it. It was just a great experience yeah and then the the whole nuclear explosion tank, the the like, missile getting loaded into yeah, the tank yeah it's all miniatures i freaking knew it yeah. i watched it and i was like this is not real but it's real and it had to be a miniature yeah, that's, that's a, amazing yeah. this oh, this tank too itself the whole scene <gasps> the whole these landscape and trees everything. are not real i am telling you right now that mother f- that mother f- back there is not real and I, I wasn't there when they filmed the miniature, but that could also be a miniature tabletop outside, outside. with real trees in the in the distance that are the right. That's so scale. cool. It almost and looks stop motion. stop motion. I was gonna say they lock, it. They, when they when they load the gun, it's stop, stop motion. Because yeah. how else are you gonna get and a I camera don't know inside who did that. a tank? You know, that's pretty that's pretty rad though. Bob Skotek, the guys that did uh, the miniatures for Alien. Actually, I think they did the explosion in the end and that all the roofs blowing off all the houses and all. Oh, that. yeah, yeah. So I'm going to guess they did the, the that miniatures makes sense. of the Because they're so good at everything they do. It, they're, yeah. They're just genius. That's why Jim Cameron uses them for everything he did in, at the time. J- Jim Cameron. James. James Cameron. James Cameron. Casually, because you've worked for James Cameron. He goes by Jim. So apparently there was a big rights issue with the Living Dead title. Oh, right, right, right. Because of the Living De- the other Living Dead movies. So there was a huge back and forth, and I don't know how it all played out in order for it to have worked for Dan. He was able to get the rights to the title Return of the Living Dead, um, and along with a couple other people. After Return of the Living Dead came out, after... It had been out for a couple of years. They decided to do some sequels. And I think they did two or three of them. And they shot them all in Romania. And they brought James Karen and Tom Matthews back, the two main actors, mm-hmm. um, but as different characters. Oh, okay. And they hired Kenny Myers to do the makeup effects. And then I think Brian Peck actually played a zombie, or a couple zombies. Oh, my in, God. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Too. Yeah, so it's like the the whole the whole group had a lot of fun working together and and just kind of kept it going. That was Dan's first directorial job, and and I thought it was amazing. Yeah, he invited me to see a, a screening of the assembly of it, and I had read the script as a total horror film. So when I saw the the screening and the screening room, there were, there were like maybe four or five people. It was just Dan watching it all together, and your grandma was in town. 
And we sat towards the front and there were a couple of people in the back. It wasn't a huge room. Your grandma at one point turned to me and said, is this supposed to be funny? Because there were parts that were genuinely like, yeah. we, we were like, we were laughing and we're like, are we not supposed to be laughing? Is Are we like insulting to laugh. Yeah. him in any way? And then we realized that in post-production, he really leaned into the performances of James and a couple other people and then changed the pacing of the editing to make stuff more humorous. Interesting. Um, and then punch up the sound to back that up. But I didn't know that going in. So we were like super cautious on, you know watching it but we knew when we saw it that it was something that we'd want to watch again so it's like okay so this is regardless gonna be good yeah so um it, it was nice to see it come out i can't believe my grandma got to watch one of the first cuts of return of the living dead before it was released that's insane yeah. grandma never told me this well it was just a weird zombie movie a weird weird historical Marking you never know history. if something's going to be historical. <laughs> I know. That's what Lynn Shay it. says. You never know. Yeah. You just want to do the best you can. And see, that's why you just put in your 100% effort every time. Yeah. You have no well, idea you have to because your name's on it. Well, why yeah. would you not? Well, I've met some people who don't in this But you town. have a, like, at least at that point in time, it's a one-shot deal. First impressions, everything. Yeah. If you don't do a good job, who's going to hire you again? Yeah. You know, if you're a dick, nobody's going to hire you. And if you do poor work, nobody's gonna why work are they going to hire you? So it's really on you to to build your reputation. Yeah. And if you can't do it, you can speak up and still save face, still have the production work. But, you know, it's just about really believing that you can and, and committing to it. So Commit. Yeah, yeah. You have to commit. Was there uh, any person you met or, like, instance... You know, because it's it's like the you making the teeth for Brian and the tests of the other woman leads to by circumstance, you know, you doing all these actual things on the movie with animatronics and puppets and things like that. Is there anything from having done that film that like led to something else in your career or just it was a great learning lesson? I think that that film as a whole was something that was just proof of. You can do this. The concept of saying yes to whatever you're offered because you're cool. being given an opportunity. If you say yes to it and go for it, yeah, then it's on you to prove whether you actually can really do it or not. I mean, I made some great friends yeah. and, and people I'm still connected with. And I think that's the best part of it is working with people you like because you're stuck with them out in the rain and in the dark for 14 hours a day. Not that I had to be in anything other than a rain box and a window for a couple hours. But, you know, there's it's definitely this sort of like bonding experience. Of course. And, and you're sharing so many unique things. That's what makes it really cool. There's a great like start because it gave me sort of an impression of what film and the film community and the family of a film could could be you know that's so true because if you had walked on and say the people were horrible or whatever it might put a bad taste in your mouth for for actually pursuing it more you yeah. know so i'm so happy that you had like a positive experience to be like okay i'm, I'm in this now my first few experiences were all super positive and i found the more that you put out Positivity. Being, positivity, being positive, yeah. The the more you know, that's very that's true. sort of built. It sort of builds around you. You know, you attract what you people put out. with the like, the like mindset, and and uh, I think that's worked pretty well for the forty some years since. Wow, forty about forty years that you've been in this business. Yeah, thriller was longer than that. That's crazy. Yep, you get old. So wow. have fun on your trip to getting old. Yes. And that's my journey right now. <laughs> and we'll be talking about that later in other episodes, such as an episode on my experience of selling my first feature movie, Living with Chucky. Although it's a documentary, I learned a lot and I'm happy to share about it. And you met another film family. Yeah. And I, and I met my film family through the process, which is amazing. And then we'll continue on in my dad's career of, um, I think next up is The Blob. The next one that I worked on mostly for myself, I worked still for right. Rick Baker, Stan Winston, or other people. Of course. Off and on. Uh, but I can't claim any of that work other than, because they were the art directors and, and supervisors right. and creatives. But yeah, I think my next thing that was like 100% my own. Was The Blob. Was The Blob. Yeah, and I'm super grateful that Rick Baker gave me the opportunity while I was on Cocoon 
to do something like this that, that I could have an experience that was all my own and I could see that I could actually do it. And he didn't have to give me that space. Thanks, um, Rick. Yeah. Shout so, out, Rick Baker. So it's pretty cool. No, you know? that's that's really huge. Yeah. So we'll just continue continue forward uh, with the podcast. But thank you for listening. I don't have anything else to say. Thanks. Thanks for uh, caring to listen. Oh, yeah. And uh, we'll try and keep you entertained. Are you not entertained? All right. Good night. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>